the day we and BK with it. We not going to waste any time, let's jump into this. He went to prison for attempted murder and robbery, expecting to spend the rest of his life behind bars. During the robbery, he hacked a victim multiple times with a meat cleaver. That did not stop his ambitions, prosecutors said. In late 2019, a new indictment accused the man, Howard Smith, a.k.a. Homo, of leading a murderous New York street gang from inside a maximum security prison in upstate New York, where he had been incarcerated since 2004. The indictment said Homo, 49, would give orders through prison phone calls, including once directing a gang member to carry out an act of violence, saying anyone who disobeyed the order would be kicked out of the gang. In conversations intercepted by prosecutors, he called himself the Godfather. He expected gang members to show their loyalty by sending him their drug proceeds, prosecutors said, allowing him to rack up $25,751 in his prison commissary account. In particular, the indictment raised questions about how an inmate with such a high-dollar commissary account had not been flagged earlier. There are currently no limits to how much money inmates can have in their commissary accounts, Mr. Gonzalez said, adding that he will refer the matter to the New York State Department of Corrections. Homo is accused of running a violent drug-dealing gang called the Brick Squad, a subset of a larger criminal organization, the untouchable Gorilla Stone Nation. Essentially, they are a part of the Bloods. The group operated primarily in Brooklyn in the neighborhoods of Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brownsville and Brooklyn Heights. Nine other defendants were indicted along with Homo, including another gang member who was already incarcerated and accused of ordering a murder from prison. Homo called his underlings through the regular prison phones that inmates were allowed to use, not through a contraband cell phone, prosecutors said, and one way he circumvented the rules was by registering his calls to another inmate's PIN number. Prosecutors said the Brick Squad was unusual from a typical street gang, which is often a disorganized group of young men who grew up on the same block. The Brick Squad adhered to a strict constitution with a clear leadership, they showed their loyalty through hand signs, clothing and music lyrics. The gang paid close attention to the members moving up and down within the hierarchy, known internally as the Forbes List, the indictment said. Two of the defendants discussed selling heroin in Atlanta to prove to Homo that they were worthy of a promotion. After one gang member was promoted, he called a friend in prison and said, there's mad discrepancies going on with the Forbes, according to prosecutors. Gang members had to memorize an elaborate coded language that would allow the phone calls from prison to go undetected. Anyone listening in would be thoroughly confused. Investigators were able to crack the code when they found handwritten sheets of paper that detailed the secret language. For instance, cocaine was air odd and heroin was home invasion. Gang members referred to people suspected of cooperating with law enforcement as college dropouts. Guns were often called duffels. Prosecutors said the gang made hundreds of thousands of dollars a year selling illegal drugs, including heroin laced with fentanyl. In a recorded conversation, one defendant said the heroin he brought from Brooklyn to sell in Maine was responsible for three overdose deaths. He discussed wanting to switch to selling crack cocaine. I was scared, bro, he told another gang member, but said the heroin was too profitable. Despite wielding tremendous power behind bars, Homo appeared to be lonely at times. He complained that gang members were not visiting him frequently enough and said that he wanted them to take care of me. In a phone call recorded by prosecutors, he lamented, nobody come see me. It is alleged that between March 2017 and December 11, 2019, Brick Squad members engaged in violence to establish geographic dominance and enforce the laws and tenets of the gang. During the course of the conspiracy the defendants allegedly sought to establish and enforce a set of rules and hierarchy within their own ranks and make money for the organization through criminal activity, primarily selling heroin laced with fentanyl, crack cocaine and marijuana. To achieve those goals, some Brick Squad members participated in violent criminal acts, including murder and shootings. Brick Squad, which operated within the confines of the 73rd, 75th, 79th, and 84th precincts, are variously charged with second and fourth degree conspiracy, second degree murder, second degree attempted murder, first and second degree attempted assault, second degree criminal possession of a weapon, second degree burglary and related crimes. The defendants face up to 25 years in prison on the top conspiracy charge, and the five defendants charged with murder face up to 25 years to life in prison. The indictment charged the gang with committing at least seven shootings and carrying out two murders near Bedford-Stuyvesant. One of the victims was a Brick Squad member himself. 
The other was a member of a rival family who after a long feud was shot and killed in April 2018. After one of the murders, the indictment said, Homo promoted the two men who handled the killing. On December 7, 2017, in the wee hours of the morning, in front of 601 Bainbridge Street in Ocean Hill, Brooklyn, Ja, acting in concert with Papancino, shot and killed fellow Brick Squad member, John Fernandez. Fernandez had dropped out of school freshman year and started getting into trouble. He already had five prior arrests and had developed an addiction to painkillers. He looked up to the gang members and eventually joined the Apes, Brick Squad. Allegedly, Fernandez had fallen in bad favor of the gang, as they felt he was not bringing in enough money, and most frowned upon, they believed he was cooperating with law enforcement. The day before he was killed, he had returned home out of breath, claiming that he was shot at. He took a few painkillers, then said he was going to go out and do a drill. However, the following day, cops found 17-year-old Fernandez's body with a gunshot wound to the neck. He was dressed in all black and wearing a ski mask. Turns out, it's alleged that the gang members tricked him into thinking they were all going to commit a robbery together. The footage showed them walking together, and when Fernandez was about to open up the gate, the person, Ja, takes out the gun and shoots him in the back. He missed, so he shoots again and this time, hits Fernandez in the neck. We cannot show the shooting. Sadly, the gang was mistaken, and Fernandez was not cooperating with law enforcement. It's alleged that Chino had ordered the hit from jail, resulting in Ja committing the murder. Supposedly, Pop played a role in the murder as well. Ja and two other members, Drew and Quasi, were under Pop and the gang. They were called the Grand Hustlers in the lineup. They would go out of town to get money selling drugs. Here, you can see video of Ja and Fernandez chilling. Crazy that the gang was ruthless enough to have Ja kill his friend. As we stated, the gang was charged with another murder. On April 18, 2018, at approximately 8.38 p.m., in front of 175 Hart Street, Quasi shot and killed Claudel Gary, a.k.a. J.O. It's alleged that Kelt sent the order to Pop, and Pop enlisted Quasi to handle the situation. Kelts was a shot caller in the gang and managed day-to-day -day operations. He accumulated north of $12,000 in his commissary and was already in prison for a manslaughter charge at the time of J.O.'s death. J.O. and his family hailed from the same territory as Brick Squad members, and there had been a year-long feud between the two groups. J.O. was shot and killed in front of the Mount Zion Pentecostal Holy Church, about block away from where he lived. We can't show the shooting, so you have to go to Patreon to see that. Links in the description. Anyway, officers found the unconscious and unresponsive body of the 37-year-old laid out. Supposedly, Quasi had fired four shots, striking J.O. in the neck and left leg. J.O. was pronounced dead at Woodhull Hospital. In addition, the indictment charges Brick Squad with a burglary in which a safe containing approximately $3,000 was allegedly stolen from one of J.O.'s family member's crib, who was also a rival. As for Quasi, coincidentally, one year after the murder of J.O., an article would come out about him and another guy getting knocked for a slew of gunpoint muggings. They took place mostly all over South Brooklyn. There was surveillance footage from those crimes. Quasi would get slapped with robbery and grand larceny charges before this indictment came down. In 2021, 16 people had died due to the horrific treatment on Rikers Island. Rikers has long been known for its unspeakable violence and inhumane conditions. The name is infamous, but people don't actually know anything about Rikers, says a public defender at the Legal Aid Society. Because of the infamy of Rikers, people assume it's a terrible place for terrible people. They think it's a place for awful people who have been convicted. Rikers is also a pretrial detention center. It's literally just anybody who can't afford bail. Pop, however, was held at Rikers without bail. He was scheduled to appear in court on October 25, 2021, nearly two years after he was arrested. Unfortunately, he'd never make his court date. Pop was tallied as one of the deaths at Rikers in 2021. He was sent to Rikers to await trial in 2019, after the indictment came down on Brick Squad. After a few months, he was transferred to the boat, a barge used to hold overflow inmates. His moms would soon learn her son came close to death when she received a phone call on July 6, 2021. Super, a friend that Pop had made at Rikers, called Pop's mom, which was later called a breach of security, to tell her that Pop had five seizures and was at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx. Super recounted to Pop's mom the events that took place prior to Pop's hospitalization. 
He was in charge of waking the inmates each morning and found Pop bloody in his bed. Pop thought he had bitten his tongue in his sleep. Coincidentally, Super's mother had a history of epilepsy and told Pop he likely had a seizure in his sleep. As Super and Pop talked, a small fire was started in a nearby cell. When officers came to put it out, Super pleaded with them to take Pop to a medic because he had a seizure, but they didn't believe him. Instead, he said, the guard sprayed him and Pop with Cell Buster, a chemical pepper spray. As a result, Pop experienced more seizures. This soon turned into a chaotic scene, as other inmates began shouting to the officers that Pop needed help. Allegedly, the officers dragged Pop, while he was still having seizures, into a cell with no cameras. They still didn't believe he was really having a seizure. Some inmates rushed in to help Pop, including one who had studied to become a paramedic. Pop's mom recalled Super telling her that while the rest of them tried to shield themselves from the pepper spray, Pop was on the floor, choking. They continued to spray the cell, telling them they'll stop spraying it if they get up and move away from him. Finally, they got out. When one of the officers realized the seriousness of Pop's condition, he was rushed to the medical unit. Super said at this point, Pop's eyes had rolled back and he was incoherent. He was then sent to the hospital. Once his mom's learned her son had been moved to the hospital, she rushed to go see him, and despite her pleading was told to leave. She recalls a confrontation in the hospital with a female police officer and hospital security, whose words stuck with her. Her exact words were, for one, your son is property of the Department of Corrections, and two, he's 23, and I don't have to tell you anything, he is not dead, Pop's mom recalls. Pop spent a couple more days in the hospital before being sent back to his cell on the boat. Weeks went by and he slowly began to recover, but the seizures had left him weak, and he had difficulty moving around like he used to. On September 21, 2021, Pop called his girlfriend and told her he wasn't feeling well. The following day he had another seizure. His mom was notified by the Department of Correction that her son had passed away, and she needed to go to Lincoln Hospital to identify his body. The medical examiner said Pop died of natural causes from a meningitis infection. According to his mom, the medical team took one hour and 41 minutes to arrive, were forced to carry Pop out down several flights of stairs, because the elevator wasn't working, and then to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Sad story. Speaking of Rikers, it's almost time to do a new video about the place. We will get around to that soon. But there is not much else to mention about these guys for right now, and this about wraps it up for this one, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.